Awesome, Pa. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to the Wells College Visiting Writers Series. I'm Dan Rosenberg, the director of the series. And as always, I want to begin by thanking the New York State Council for the Arts, which has funded our series for many years, and I hope will continue to do so for years to come. Um, tonight, I'm very excited that Shane McRae will be joining us. Um, here's how this evening will work for people who are new to our series. I'll introduce Shane and then um, throughout the event, if you think of a question or a comment, or you just want to react to a particular turn of phrase, really anything, please do so right in the chat and I will periodically jump in and read out what you have written so Shane will have a chance to respond. Um, if we have time left at the end, we can move to a more traditional Q&A as well. But what usually happens, and what I hope will happen again tonight, is that we'll end up in a natural and organic conversation that takes us to the end of our time. Um, and here at the top, um, I just want to thank well, people. I was premature in saying folks were here. We're getting a lot of a lot of people popping in. Welcome, everyone. Um, here at the top, I just want to thank those of you who have been coming to these events all year and asking questions, making comments. Um, keeping the series as dynamic and engaged as it strives to be. And to those of you who are new to our series, I'm really glad that these virtual events have opened up what we do to a wider audience. Um, and welcome, welcome everyone. So um, I will put in the chat right now, let me see if I can do this, do, do, do a link, where is it? Here we are. All right, I'm going to put in the chat a, okay, um, sorry, one second, we are going to remove that person. Um, not experienced that before, that's great. Um, <laughs> yep, and we will do that. So where where were we? Fun times. Um, okay, so I'll put in the chat right now, which hopefully people can now look at, is the link to how one could um, purchase Shane's most recent collection, Sometimes I Never Suffered, from our local Ithaca bookstore, um, Buffalo Street Books. Um, and I'll remind you again at the end. And let me see, let me see how we're doing here. We are good. Um, all right, moving forward. And I will go ahead and do that. Um, thank you, Amelia Fulton, for saying you are just here for the poetry. That is great. Um, hmm. This is wild. All right, I might ask people to have, here we go. Everyone can only chat to me now. So that will affect that, I think. All right, where were we? I'm sorry, everyone. That is not, not fantastic, but your messages will come to me and I will read them out to Shane and that's how we'll play this game. Um, all right, here we go. I'm gonna introduce Shane McRae, which I'm very excited to do. Um, but I'm not entirely sure how to do it. I am reminded of the opening to the Odyssey when Odysseus is described in Robert Fagel's translation as the man of twists and turns. Um, Emily Wilson renders that same description simply as a complicated man. When you open up, sometimes I never suffered. The table of contents tells you that the book is in four-ish sections maybe with a proem and an interlude, but the main sections are numbered. They're numbered one, two, two, one. Then on the next page, there's a preface identifying the entire book as the conclusion of a larger poem, which began with sequences in two of McRae's prior books, all of which is to say that this book is a collection of poems and itself of a larger poem scattered across three books in numbered sections that don't progress as much as they curve back on themselves. It's complicated, man. But even if the detail of these macro structures seem at first to skirt over our brains, what lands and grows, for me anyway, is that there's an architecture to what's happening here, a faith in a governing intelligence that seems almost anachronistic in our moment, an idea 
that the world and words might be ordered. Or it would seem anachronistic to me if it weren't balanced by what happens when you turn the next page. What happens then is that the poems begin and immediately you're caught up in an incomparable voice. McCrae carves a unique path through American poetry. His work is formally sophisticated and traditional in its use of meter and rhyme, though you wouldn't know it by looking at the poems or even necessarily by hearing them. McCrae buries his formalism in layers of sound play and repetition in ways that remind me of Gerard Manley Hopkins sonnets because they sound nothing like sonnets because they overwhelm you with music beyond what's demanded by the form. At the same time, McCrae's poems are so insistently spoken, so insistently verbal in their repetitions, their recursions, their democratic musicality. They twist and turn like Odysseus's mind, like all of our minds. Um, coming back to our obsessions, trying other tacks, pausing to gather ourselves before leaping again toward the unknown. So I've suggested that he's a formalist and also an experimental poet. I would say yes to both. I'd also note in my experience of reading Shane McRae, he's a poet of complex faith and a political poet. Um, he said that he wanted this book to be less political than his others, but that turned out to be impossible that those obsessions he keeps returning to are inescapable. American racism and race relations, issues around social class, what it means to be American in general. That is, he's an alert human alive today in our country and alive to the complexities of this moment. In one of the poems from this book that has taken up permanent residence in my mind, the speaker, who's a mixed race man, um, who I'm sure Shane will tell us a little bit more about, the speaker contemplates his heritage. We are the ghosts of who comes after us and their memorial, he says, and I'm in. He imagines people looking at him and seeing a history or future of black bodies thrashing around on his back, but he insists that they're not really thrashing. The wrong is in the eye, the one that's watching, he says. And I wanna sit with that for a minute. Um, then the poem ends with him considering those black people on his back, that heritage he receives and is a part of creating as a storm cloud, like the clouds I've seen from which I've seen stars born, such storms as are the glory of the dark. And that's where I, as a reader, am struck silent. Shane McRae is the author of several poetry collections, including In the Language of My Captor, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and this most recent collection, Sometimes I Never Suffered, which was shortlisted for the 2020 T.S. Eliot Prize. His honors include a Whiting Writers Award, Lanham Literary Award, the Ainsfield Wolf Book Award, Guggenheim Fellowship, and a fellowship from the NEA. Shane McRae lives in New York City and teaches at Columbia University, Shane, hello, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, oh Shane, yeah, that was our our uh, our smooth transition. There we go. Yeah, no, hi, thank you. I muted myself because I was um, gonna drink Sprite, and I, if I did so, would have made noise, um, and it would have taken the focus off you where it belongs and put it on me. Um, drinking Sprite. So I'm sorry about that. I just thought if I can mute myself, I can unmute myself. Uh, anyway, thank you for that really uh, wonderful introduction. It was really kind of you. Uh, and thank you for having me here and uh, to everyone at, at, at Wells uh, for making this happen. Um, the poem you quoted used to be the poem uh, uh, that I ended my readings with, but I'm actually not going to read it. So, um, but I will explain who the character is uh, a little bit later. Um, his name is Jim Limber, um, but I'll explain who he is when I get to the Jim Limber poem. Um, I am gonna read from Sometimes I Never Suffer. Um, I suffered, but I'm also gonna read new things. Um, I always feel like I need to apologize for that. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna read new poems. <laughs> I feel bad about it. Um, I'm gonna start with new poems and I'm gonna end with new poems, but um, Sometimes I Never Suffered um, is gonna be in the middle. So. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a group of poems that um, I guess I sort of imagine as being um, part of whatever 
my next next book is. Um, for a little bit of background, I don't know if it's useful because the poems will say this anyway. Um, I was uh, kidnapped when I was three by my mother's parents. I was taken from my father and I didn't see him again um, for uh, 13 years. Um, and the short version of the reason was because, you know, I'm mixed race. My father's black, my mother's white. Um, my grandparents on my mother's side were very racist, so they didn't want me around black people. And so they just took me from um, Salem, Oregon to Austin, Texas. Um, uh, so that's sort of the background of uh, this first group of poems I'm gonna read. So um, this is called uh, In the Ditch Where the Camera Finds My Body. I'm splashing in the driveway in a ditch in which a corpse of rain has gathered. Here, a corpse has gathered. Wearing nothing, a full diaper, I am three. A clear sky leans as if upon a bar, upon the house and everyone in the picture. My grandmother, me, I am the rain come down. My mother's parents have just kidnapped me. I am the corpse in which I play. I'm dancing in the court. The clear sky sickens, watching, but with no clouds in the sky, the sky can't move away. Behind me, picking flowers, my mother's mother sees the green has fled the leaf. Oh, reader, listener, stay. You are now evident. Uh, so I'm in the habit of kind of barreling through my reading, uh, Dan, but I, I'm going to try to be available for any uh, questions or anything that might come up. This um, is called uh, Something Grand I Was. We must have flown, I don't remember flying. My mother's parents, me, a three-year-old. We must have flown, we couldn't have, if who was going to drive the car from Oregon to Texas, Salem, that means peace, to Austin. I think he was a soldier, Steve F. Austin. I see us sometimes in a C-130, a military plane, but big enough for us, our car and thing from Oregon to Texas, Salem, that means peace. Too big for us, our car and things, but shouldn't it have been too big, enormous, something grand? I was being kidnapped. Shouldn't it have been impossible? 100,000 pounds of steel, aluminum and blood, the sky itself incredulous and mocking. Shouldn't the flock of birds have struck the props like laughter? The sky have shamed us then from its birth heart. This is called, uh, after my grandparents kidnapped me, they moved to a new development. The only scenes I know are scenes my mother's parents thought to take pictures of me in the ditch. My mother's father in the yard before the fence was built before the lawn was fitted to the earth, face like a face after a mauling. He is posing like, a hunter in the dirt. He grips a hoe and kneels in the court called everywhere. A neighborhood is coming where an armed man kneels and grins. That man will build a house. Uh, let's see, I think I have two more of these. Uh, and then the last two are both on it. Um, just like the first one. Uh, this is uh, explaining my appearance in certain pictures. In pictures now, I do not smile and didn't then. I would laugh if I was being pickled. And sometimes one, my mother's mother, would pickle me and the other would take the picture, my mother's father. And so sometimes I'm not smiling, but I'm laughing, my eyes closed and my mouth open, almost like I'm screaming, but I'm laughing when I was a child in pictures with my kidnappers, with one, my mother's mother always. I am sitting most often in her lap, her arms around my blurred waist. She has me on riddle it. And the trick is wait until the laughing stops. As the mouth closes, you can take me from her. And this is the last of these. It's called A Window in the House from Which I Was Kidnapped. Oh, and I should say, uh, I haven't, I've never read it, but I've been certain since I wrote it um, that uh, the word gift, 
I'm not going to say GIF. It's going to sound like GIFT. So it is not GIF, it's GIF, G-I-F. A window in the house from which I was kidnapped. The pale blinds rise and fall a gift forever. The blinds move on their own. At first, my father stands with the string between his fingers first and middle pulling even after it tears into his fingers, tears the first and middle skin. Him pulling, letting go, his blood staining the length of the loop string nearest him. At first, he pulls the string for years. Eventually, he steps back from the window. Into the room, he steps back, doesn't turn now. He watches from a shadow in the room. For me, his child to be returned to him. I see him watching from a farther shadow whenever I look into his eye. The room is endless. So, um, there's the part I mentioned. Um, I'm gonna read from Sometimes I Never Suffered. Um, all of these poems are spoken by uh, Jim Limber. Um, so Jim Limber was a historical figure. Um, in the last year of the Civil War, um, he was uh, taken by, uh, Jefferson Davis's wife, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederate States of America, uh, Jim Limber was taken by Jefferson's uh, wife, Marina Davis, to live with the Davis family um, for the last year of the war. Uh, Jim was supposed to have been probably about seven years old at the time. Um, what happened was Marina Davis was uh, returning um, home uh, from shopping. She saw a woman um, beating a child by the side on the side of the road. She had her. She stopped her carriage, and just took the child and took him home. Um, and so it's unclear who the woman was. I've always sort of assumed it was probably Number's mother. Um, in the book, sometimes I never suffered. Well, no, I should say this way. What actually happened was that Number lived with the Davis family for about a year. Um, it was considered to be something of an informal adoption. Um, and uh, at, when the uh, Union won the war and captured Davis and the family, Limber was separated from them. And um, it's unclear what happened to him. Um, some people thought he died or was killed by the Union soldiers. Uh, but there are some mentions of him, um, very obscure mentions in, in, in letters in the Davis family. So it's, it's really not 100% sure what happened to him after the war. Um, but these poems um, are all written from um, heaven, um, and the Jim Limber who's speaking them is dead. Um, one, of the, one of the caveats being that um, the, the sequence of poems, these are all sonnets, Limber always speaks in sonnets. Um, the sequence of poems imagines or assumes uh, a multiverse, and so um, it's also a multi heaven which means that every limber who's speaking is a different one slightly in some way or other, even if it's just in my imagination. You can still read the poem in sequence, but they're all supposed to be spoken by a different person um, with the same name. Um, and of course, similar experiences to the other one, but not always the same. Anyway, um, I just said that they're all spoken from heaven, but I think the first two I'm gonna read actually are not. So what is my problem? This is called Jim Limber Tells the Truth About His Fate. Nobody knows I know what happened to me after I was taken from the Davises. Some think the Yankee soldiers who took me, I fought them hard, took me away. Some think they must have drowned me in a river. Some think they must have taken me up north. I could have disappeared in the north forever, easy as I could have disappeared at death. I dis disappeared forever and I didn't die. I died and disappeared forever. Either way, I disappeared, I died. Bless you, them soldiers don't matter what you believe. It only ever matters who believes and what they have the power to do. <clears throat> this is, dang it. All right, this is Jim Limber's home is no earthly. White Yankees think they're heaven because they think they know how I was treated in the South, because they know how they would treat me. Because it ain't nothing special makes white Yankees different from the white folks down South, just up North before the war, the loudest white folks yelled, 
yelled to save me. That ain't nothing special. I yelled when Yankees took me from Mama Varina. She just stretched her arms toward me like she was too weak to fight the Yankees. I was kicking them and shouting like they were stealing me from home. But home where the white folks who take you, take you. Home follows your sorrow. So it is like that. So this uh, next poem is um, Jim Limber describes his arrival in heaven. I never think to say this before I read it, so I'm gonna say it this time. Um, the poem assumes that the woman um, uh, who was beating him was in fact his mother. Um, and it also assumes that um, they were uh, escaping slavery, which of course they wouldn't have been doing having been spotted by the side of the road, but you know. This is uh, Jim Limber describes his arrival in heaven. What was it like? It wasn't like the candle went out in my bedroom and next I found myself in the sun outside. I felt myself, my body much more so much I couldn't tell for sure if it was mine, I thought I was chasing a big dog through the tallest grass I'd ever seen, grass taller than the tall grass me and mama hid from the master in. The night before the morning, Mrs. Davis took me away. And somehow that dog stayed just an inch or two ahead. I was already dead and had been dead some time. Then all at once, I saw the grass was giant wings it was angels me whipping my hand. Okay. Um, this next one uh, is called Jim Limber's The Odyssey. And The Odyssey um, is very simply explained and probably so simply that it's kind of incorrect. It's essentially a justification of the ways of God to, to human beings. Um, it can be thought of as a defense, uh, an argument. Um, for the godliness of God, for the godness of God uh, in a world in which um, evil exists. So Jim Limber's The Odyssey. What if it heaven was like my mama said it would be, like gardens spread, like blankets spread wide between rivers, gardens full like rivers with good food, all kinds, fish, but also okra fried hot, and bread and chicken and even candy all served on dishes like the dishes white folk got. What if it heaven was like what we laughed about over supper sometime? And we were here together now in heaven and we saw it together, me and mama now, in heaven on a picnic between those rivers. What if in heaven we could have white things and not be white? How would we know how good it was if it was good for everyone? Um, okay. Um, hey, Shane, I, um, I think that's, that's so fantastic. I'm glad to, to have you read these. I'm, I'm seeing some people in the, in the chat, um, thinking about the question of like this being a historical figure and, and someone, and if I'm, if I'm, if I understand it correctly, he sort of disappears, he disappears from the historical record, right? Like we don't really know what happened yeah. to him. Um, like, how did you navigate the sort of the ethics, I guess, of writing in the voice of a of an actual historical person? Like, did you was is it different for you sort of experientially than just like making up a persona and and like why what drew you to him? And then is his is his actual historical reality an important part of your your sense of him as a character? That's a lot of questions. It is. Um, I just pick your favorite one. <laughs> uh, I mean, my answers for this kind of question are always very unsatisfactory. Um, if Jim Limber is going to be a part of any art at all, and of course, it's a question as to whether Jim Limber should or shouldn't be, um, um, then um, there's kind of no alternative but to make it al almost all of it up. There's very, there, Jim Limber's presence in history is almost not at all. Um, and so I understand the parameters of the ethical question generally. But when we're dealing with someone who I think is historically important and of whom other people, of whom people should be aware, but with regard to whom there is actually no record of anything they ever said, 
and really very little record of anything they ever did. Um, it, it feels like the only other alternative is to just sort of treat them as if they never existed. Because um, there's really not a lot, there's not really any historical record that, you know, you can base what Jim Limber said or did upon other than the very few mentions of him in the letters uh, of the Davis family and in diaries and stuff. There's just not much. So um, it wasn't really something I felt um, especially, it didn't, it, it, it didn't cause me a whole lot of anxiety because again, it, it, it didn't feel like it was, if I wanted to write about Limber, there wasn't much else to do. Um, and, so, and there's a way in which particularly, um, well, I should clarify that a little bit. Jim Limber appears in a book of mine called In the Language of My Captor. And in that also, and in that book, in that sequence, those are all spoken from Jim Limber's life. And every one of those, I was very careful to base upon what existed in the historical record. They're all spoken by Limber, and of course there is no record of anything he said, but the events, um, those that were verifiable by history, you know, I, try, or I tried to make sure that those were accurate, as accurate as I could possibly make them based on the records that we have. But these poems, because they're all spoken from the afterlife, there's no record, of course. And so it, it was very much an invented thing. The character was invented based on um, uh, Jim Limber, um, the, the Jim Limber I knew from earlier poems and hi the historical record, but the invented thing um, was Jim Limber's speech, which again, I just had, to, what I had to go by was sort of a general sense of how people might have talked 150 years ago. Um, but keeping in mind that this Jim Limber has been around for an unspecified amount of time and have um aware of historical developments to some extent. Um, and so it was very much like creating a character. Um, and I thought that um, Limber was a voice, I mean, I say it that way because I invented the voice. I thought it would, it would be a good idea if people, particularly Americans, were at least aware of Jim Limber's existence. Um, and he became an integral part of the sequence I was writing. And I felt like he should return um, in, in the sort of the, at the end of the sequence. In the, in the of it. That's fascinating. That's really great. I, I don't want to keep us from from more poems for too long, but I, I'm just I'm curious myself. Sort of, how did you encounter him, and and what drew you to him as a figure who you might want to um, to write in in the voice of to invent a voice for? Sure. Um, somebody mentioned him on Twitter um, a few years ago. Um, somebody I don't know how the conversation had gotten started. I just stumbled across it. But somebody mentioned the Jim Limber story I hadn't heard. And then somebody replied to that saying that um, they volunteered me to write um, a novel about Jim Limber. And of course, I couldn't write a novel. Um, but seeing that mention, you know, it, it got me curious as to who Jim Limber was. And then um, the day I first read about him, I wrote the first Jim Limber poem. Um, and then um, just kept writing them. I think I was drawn to him. Um, because he was kidnapped too and raised by white supremacists too, although it was a little bit different, more extreme for him. And the situation was more extreme, but there were still some biographical similarity. And so um, I think, although I didn't articulate it that way at the time, I think that there was that connection um, that essentially sort of meant that when I was writing about Jim Limber, to some extent, I was writing about myself. Um, I think that drew me to beyond the sort of extreme interest of his own story. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks so much for that. It's really interesting. It does speak to how, I mean, I think a lot of your, your poems sort of fluctuate between things that are obviously research-based and then things that feel closer to, you know, your lived experience in, in various ways. But I don't think that there's a huge difference in my experience of the poems in either way. And so you, you, talking about a sort of identification with this character as part of the initial attraction makes a ton of sense to me. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, okay, so I have four more Jim Limber poems. Um, and then back to the new one. Um, so um, this is, I think, um, this includes my first, oh wait, I was gonna say this is my first Pete's reference of the night, but it's not, obviously. 
because um, if, you know, a window in the house from which I was kidnapped, uh, the pale blinds rise and fall a gift forever. Um, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. You know, it's not the same thing. I still think it's a Keats reference. Uh, there are a lot of Keats references in my uh, poem. Um, so here's my second one, um, at least that I'm aware of. Call, and it's called Jim Limber in Heaven Writes His Name in Water. You walk through heaven anywhere to anywhere on that soft green grass. Or know where it don't matter. Anywhere you walk are bright and cool, and it's about a foot wide stream of the cleanest water anywhere. With each step you take, part the grass beside you on your left side if you're left handed, and on your right side otherwise. Just reach down if you're thirsty or you're dirty or you're hot. They got the sun in heaven still, and folks get hot sometimes. Me, sometimes I walk just to see the stream here. Sometimes I lead it through my name. On earth, I couldn't spell my name. Now my great thirst has been revealed. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the poems in which I imagine um, in a very, 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 very uh, minimally sketched way, some sort of um, future for Jim Limber. Um, on earth before he died, um, still dead, well, but uh, I, I was trying to differentiate this one from the other. And this is a Jim Limber on the gardens of the face of God. Never was good with women. I mean, I had a few woman friends at the factory, but that was work. And sometimes I think they were nice to me because they had to be nice to the men even the men beneath me. And I retired where I started now. But nobody has to be nice in heaven. Nobody has to smile. God is a woman for some folk in heaven and God is a man for others. And for some folk, God is both and neither one. For some folks, God is neither one and nothing in between. I see folks, gods, whenever I see their faces. But God don't look like anybody here. For me, God is a woman, and her face is black as a black, bright black stone. I've walked with her on the path between the apple orchard and the garden in spring, when the orchard is a garden. So I'm down to there's just two more of these. This is um, Jim Limber tells what he knows about heaven. Heaven's a horse, a train, a ship with no captain or with a captain, but the captain is a Negro. Our rowboat tied but loosely to the dock, the river peaceful, nobody or everybody is. A Negro, it's a hundred Negroes on the dock. A thousand Negroes like when Jesus broke the bread to feed 10,000 people, maybe 15, and the bread just grew and grew. The dock just grows, grows beneath me. 10,000 Negroes cheering you to freedom, 100,000, and you got good shoes and walk to the rowboat smiling and untie it. But heaven ain't you running, but you stay. And this one, um, Jim Limber on Possibility, uh, ends with a um, Dante uh, reference. Um, uh, although never far from me, my favorite translation of Dante is the one Keats read um, by Carrie, C-A-R-Y, who I don't think anybody reads anymore. This is Jim Limber on Possibility. What if I had been born in heaven do, they do that here. I've never seen a baby, but I've seen full grown people who I hear the angels whispering. They say they were babies when they die. I always look those people in the eye, but I don't think they see me. And I've never heard them speak. They just walk around in sailor hats with blank looks on their faces. Those white hats with the blue anchors. I sometimes see them walking with their mouths open. The first one I saw, I saw like that. And when I tried to talk to him, it was like I wasn't there. So I peeked in his mouth. And in his mouth was the whole sky and stars. So, um, 
the rest of these, as I said, are new. Well, I mean, kind of. This oh. one, the one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Before uh, before you you pivot away, um, that's so wonderful to hear these poems. We actually had another question in the chat. Um, asking saying i'd be curious to hear about what led to the choice of a multiverse was it a way to write from heaven from the dead a response to all the ways to look at and from within jim limber something else like they're, they're thinking about the multiverse in particular and these various iterations of this character ah uh, i don't really know i think it's because i think i mean i'm you know very much a christian and I don't know exactly how this figures into the multiverse, although I guess if you think about it, the multiverse isn't necessarily problematic for Christianity at all. Um, but uh, um, I guess because I'm, I like it as an explanation for certain things. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to prove, obviously, um, but there are some very um, tantalizing uh, suggestions that it might in fact be a real thing. Um, and uh, I don't know, um, since I thought it was real, um, I thought I should write about it. Although I should add that um, I have a whole, the whole part of this three part poem I wrote um, is called Purgatory. And I guess I don't believe in Purgatory. So um, I wrote about a thing as if it were real, even though I don't think it's real. Uh, but I do think a multiverse might be real. It seemed like I should do it because I thought it was true. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Did it was it useful? Because I think about you've talked about your relationship to form in a in a way that maybe is relevant here, where you said like your goal isn't to have the form be super visible or audible for the reader. It's not like you're trying to play a game with them about the tradition so much as using some traditional formal constraints as a way to shape your own your own composition practice, right? Is that was thinking about sort of multiple multiple instantiations of of heaven in this character is sort of useful for you as you were moving from one poem to another type of poem to sort of be freed up from being like accountable to what came before? Oh, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I like this idea of writing a sequence without sequence. And it was only in the midst of doing so that I realized it wasn't possible, <laughs> at least not possible for me. And so, um, I liked the idea that I wasn't responsible to, for anything that came before uh, or to anything that came before, but of course I was because that's, the narrative drive is very powerful. Um, and so, you know, it, there's, there are ways in which it was, and that's one of them, um, there are ways in which it was a sort of failed experiment, but um, I at least liked that idea, yeah. Fantastic, that's so cool. Well, okay, so, um, they're all new, except for this next one isn't exactly new. It's um, been, it's in, 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 my, in my next book, this poem is gonna appear. Um, the rest of them are from the next, next book, which is considerably more imaginary than my next book, which is finished scheduled. Um, so, um, and I should also specify perhaps the next two poems are in some sense about Lucy Brock Broido, um, who died brain cancer um, a few months after I uh, first got to know her um, um, and to whom um, in many ways I, I owe my life. Um, I certainly owe the life I have in New York to, um, in, in, in a big way to Lucy. Um, so this is the first of two poems about Lucy in some sense or another. This is called um, A Letter to Lucy About Lucy. Oh, I should also add, for those of you who don't know, um, one of her books is called The Master Letter. She gave it with her living hand to me, a copy of The Master Letter with her living hand to me, thick with the thickness they now, I can't say how many reprintings later new copies have lost, the paper they're printed on is thinner now, but it itself was new. She gave it to me new. She must have had it since the book was new to her. She must have kept it in her castle. She signed it in the little castle. That was where we were. Together, she, you must have kept it in your castle for 20 years, master. How long had you lived in the castle? Before I, for a single afternoon, came, where are you, to ask? I think 
The castle followed you your whole life. And now you've taken the castle to wherever you have gone. Master of now, dawn from now. She must have kept that copy for 20 years before she, with her living hand, gave it to me, a paperback still glossy with the printing date, 497, still glossy beneath the gloss, our master was it printed on the gloss, as we are, we who walk on earth are printed on the gloss, and liable to smudge and disappear if touched. I ask you, where are you to ask? I might have called you after I heard, but first I'll tell the story. We were underground waiting for a train, my daughter and I waiting for an A or D to ride it down to Union Square when I heard a woman go under the train. And the sound must have been the train crushing her body, but the sound sounded like a piece of paper tearing. That was what it sounded like. Then screaming, and the screaming was the sound I turned to. Master, then I turned my daughter's face away. I might have called you after. I might have said it sounded like paper. Master, where are you to ask? Do you know now to whom she was master, the woman beneath the train? You must have kept it in your little castle, not for me in particular, but for whoever would be there calling you when your love was called to cross the bridge from hand to hand the book would for a moment make as it was given. And I was there. I called you and you with your living hand took the book down from the shelf beside the sprig of heather from the Bronte's moor and handed it, a sprig that looked alive still of green heather from across the sea. So I didn't think to mention it, but that was the third Keats reference, um, a living hand. Uh, in the poem. Um, this is called um, How Frightened in the Sturdy House. Uh, I guess I should say, I don't know if this is worth knowing. Um, when I met Lucy, as I said, she died a few months after I met her. I met her in, uh, I guess, May? <laughs> it's not, but um, she died the next year. Uh, when I met her, um, she would have already had the brain tumor that eventually killed her. But when I met her, she didn't know about it. Um, uh, so um, for some reason, that seemed relevant to the poem. This is called How Frightened in the Sturdy House. To where has it now leaped? The animal crouched on your brain the day we met. That field readied for planting, twisted the furrows knock the rivering courses by the lifelong shaking world that field beneath the skull upon which it the animal once stalked and chased and killed and fed so that no seed could rise thrown from those scattering hands to where has now the killer gone that kept the planter from the field and still devoured the planter how frightened the sturdy house who watched it pounce and tear its prey from the window thinking, no, I am not torn in the plowed field. And soon the animal will leave. Who watched the corpse and saw the animal and was transfixed. Although the animal had left the corpse, the planter saw it still. To where has it now leaped? The animal that crouched, muscled and bodiless the day we met and passed through the latched gate, through the wall at the back of the planter's house, through the kitchen, and seeing the planter at the window still, the day we met, your doctor hadn't found it yet. It crouches low again. It growls. I don't know about that poem. I tried. Um, so I've just got three poems left. Um, the um, first two, uh, first one I wrote today, the next one I wrote the day before, I mean, yesterday, that's the word for that. Um, and then the last one I wrote a few months ago, um, and they're kind of, they should be in reverse order. The last one I'm going to read is called Hex, um, and it's like six pages long. Um, and the next two I'm going to read are both called After Hex. Um, I don't know if any of that is useful information, but the After Hexes are the newer ones. 
in some kind of counting down, I guess. So this is uh, after hex two. One's opportunities to be unhappy are both indiscernible and too big, like the gray wall of a gropius in fog. And as you rise, bewildered from the campus lawn, as you are helped up from the campus lawn, although immediately you kneel and grope for the shoe the building knocks from your now wet right foot. As you are groping, you are asked again. Again, you are required to state your name and name the place you think you will be able to distinguish your warm blood from the cold accumulation of the fog. But when you touch the grass, no, it's all cold. This is called, I mean, I guess I did it. This is after hex one. One's opportunities to be unhappy are dynamic, ever expanding. A Ford Mustang chasing the sun as it sprints panic to the Western limit, which was the morning you first didn't think of the riot. And for weeks afterward, and following what once had seemed, and anybody would have said so, seemed to have been a sequence of events in time and only to the intelligentsia, then hidden. Now they scurry from one nimbus to another down the block until they disappear in darkness. Then they reappear in light, then disappear again in darkness. And then finally, beneath the next street light, they're gone. They disappear in light. To whom what seemed to you a sequence was a sphere of time, expanding in a space with limits and with walls at its limits in which objects are attacks the space paid to what authority? The sphere of the riot for what seemed like weeks, but it was only minutes. The sphere was conveyed, a polished gem from hand to hand, one representative to the next, one party to the other, in the weeks of their competitive expressions of concern, in the minutes of those weeks, rolling a golden coin across guard knuckles, a magician, or a criminal, but both, the coin, a spear in the space between two hands, a coin in the hand. Eventually, like bullets in America, the riot passes through our head, and we forget the riot. Everything. What once seemed strange to you becomes your heart, America. Your heart's blood strange to you, hidden in you the truest part of you, unknowable, a minotaur of the hidden God, who is not you, the God, not even of your own heart. So this next poem is the last one I'm gonna read. Um, and thank you all again um, for coming. Uh, and thank you, Dan, for having me. Um, and it seems like I'm gonna actually go all the way to eight and I apologize already. Um, and, and this is called Hex. are limited, but only by one's own imagination, but is limited only by things unseen. As Bark Psychosis did it, music, at the start of the new music, Hex itself the start of the new music, after Talk Talk started it, who after This Heat started it, who after Public Image Limited, though John Lydon has since gone bad, or more offensively is who he always was, who after Public Image Limited started it, going bad, and not to mention Slint, not to mention the American, Leiden and Morrissey gone, or are in American, America. For Trump or in Los Angeles, bad. Morrissey, not even new, was never new, except his talent was, and Johnny Marr. And always the dead old art will suffer further life if new artists of irresistible ability work to extend it. Though such artists must not seek to extend the dead old art, or they will fail, but must make only what they must make. And if it aligns with the dead, the dead will live again in what they make. Low string and keening dissonances when the strings ascend together, sirens of the cops inside, their wooden bodies, their brown bodies. Listen, first the sirens come from nowhere in the world except for them. For them the sirens come, announcing nowhere. And then the lights from nowhere round the corner, red like an idea of fire, as the drums roll beneath the string, 
a shopping cart, a bar from where it rolled beneath the city, on a sidewalk in the day, in the middle of the city, a roll beneath the city, the strings from which the sirens come, the lights that chase the sirens down and live as an idea of fire and nowhere no guitars. But space and stillness where guitars would be. Stillness and space and a boy singing his lone unhappiness in the midst of the raw world. To whom I would escape from the midst of the raw world. It's now oppressive stillness. And it's windowless disease, it's timelessness. It's timelessness, it's nothing's happening in my life. I don't have time to be dead, where to run from time. In the windowless room, in the room in which you sealed yourself at the start of the pandemic, hoping for more life, more time, as bark psychosis did it at the start of the new music and made a sound to which one wanders from life and in which one wanders still having arrived. One's opportunities to be unhappy are unlimited, though often lately limited by the end of the world. But maybe the end of the world is ending. Maybe soon one will be in small ways sad again. One's opportunities available to one's attention, lightens to the horseman whinnying himself on the fetid, bloating horse, long since afraid to kick his spurs and pop it, but he makes an eager whinny, hoping to sound ready. He is ready to be the last American, Winnie and Heck and Winnie. Hills unfurl beneath him to the hill, beneath the surface of Lake Erie and the ice above the hill that seems to constitute the lake from somewhere other than the lake. To be a picture of a dead lake, the surface of the thing, a picture of something else. How far we travel now to be in the now impossible presence of things to which we ride in light that touches and is never touched all things by anything, us, even in the light. How far we travel, we have traveled to, to watch the lake unmoving from the parking lot, approaching the moment, it, the moment, was already in our minds accomplished, the long visionary gaze across the ice, in the midst of which, the gaze, the ice infinite, has no mist, no middle, but is made of middles echoing. In the midst of the gaze, the moment through which the visionary moment we will leave our bodies gazing, or at least our minds, for once won't trouble what we see. Such peace accomplished. We have known our peace accomplished on the drive to the lake. And by the time we reach the lake, we've turned around already in our minds. Such peace accomplished and retreated from, except we part, except we gaze at the white expanse and sigh, not knowing which emotion demands the sigh. And the sigh leaves us, staggering, the butterfly, our frozen breath, as butterflies have staggered, you have watched it, seemed uncertain where to land, upon which flower, you've watched a butterfly choosing. Or if it wasn't choosing, still it seemed to choose a flower patterned like itself. Our breath escaping in the haze of its occasion, you watch yours disintegrate and do not recognize yourself. But I am watching and I see you breathing and watching I can't see beneath the picture of awe on your face, the image of the visionary moment. And even if it isn't happening beneath you, I forgive myself for feeling nothing, no visionary, seeing you. And the hills roll beneath the surface of the lake as Mogwai did it, no singing, but in guitar. And sometimes human voices singing, keyboard sometimes. In 1997, three years after Heck, at the start of the new music, each guitar a wall and hammer, bolt. If we forgave ourselves for making what we have made, we would destroy what we have made before we'd let ourselves enjoy it. No, we won't release ourselves to joy with our forgiveness, never. And so we build a tower from the top of which we hope to reach forgiveness. Opportunities for one to be unhappy are unlimited, a pitch of silence in the everyday unsounding. One's opportunities belong to one, but rogue unhappinesses claim their midst in a consuming infinity that even now approaches yours. As Enya did it, though you didn't notice. Listen, the songs are hit, but listening, the sure connections between all things become long clouds. America, the sure connections fray in clouds at the capital, 
And those who scream they want you back have never seen you and wouldn't recognize you if you came. And those who lie face down on the floor in the chamber see the floor only. The woman on the other side of the door, wide-eyed and bleeding, sees no metaphor. Oh music, where have you fled? Oh music, who will make you name? That's it, thank you. It ended with a Keats reference, by the way, uh, I should add. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, and we are we are at time. Um, I am afraid <laughs> that pe people in the chat are wondering, like, wait, why can't I chat to everyone? This was fantastic, and they want to share how much they've enjoyed it. Um, that is the small price that we're paying for, you know, one or two small people at the very beginning of of this event. But um, I will I will be the conduit of your celebration, and um, it is it is effusive and multiple. And I'm so glad that people have had uh, the chance to hear you read these poems tonight, Shane, and such a positive experience. Um, thank you all again for coming. I'm putting back in the chat there to everyone um, a link if you would like to order Shane's most recent book, as opposed to, or maybe in addition to the next one and the one after that, which is. Um, didn't wasn't there a reviewer who who referred to you as upsettingly prolific or some, something like that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, I just I like writing and I write a lot. Um, and you know, yeah, I guess they're just uh, jealous, man. Don't worry about it. I think that's <laughs> no, I can't imagine that. But um, yeah, I think somebody probably said something. Um, but it's it's wonderful. I'm so glad that um, that you were able to join us. I'll I'll tell you all our next event. Um, two events actually coming up in about a week and a half. The acclaimed novelist, Diane Cook, whose book, The New, Wil the New Wilderness was a finalist for the 2020 Booker Prize. We'll be two doing two events on Thursday, April 8th. There's a public fiction masterclass entitled The Natural World with natural and scare quotes um, at five. And then she's gonna be doing a reading at seven. The link for those are on the Facebook page. Um, Wells Visiting Writers, or um, you can see all the information at wells.edu forward slash visiting writers. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us there. Um, I concur with the messages in the chat. Those poems about America are so great. Shane, thank you again for sharing them with us and everyone in the uh, in the audience tonight. Thanks so much for coming and for your, your comments and questions in the chat. It has been lovely to see all your faces um, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Good night. Good night.